I'm Andrea Brown and I'm a swim mum of over 10 years. I have two competitive swimmers who are at national level and like most parents out there with any sort of after school sport going on, we spend lots of time eating meals in the car and getting up for early morning training. Recently, I've seen a number of things that, to be honest, just made me feel sad. And they were all around mental health. We went on our own journey with that and learned a lot. And I decided I wanted to share what we found out with the swimming community. This is a sport that we love. So this is our way of giving back. I think the crux of the problem is that you don't know what you don't know. So the mental health issue is not um, specific to sport. It's just a, a, an epidemic, really, that's going through our society. But you start coupling that with the added pressures that you have in sport and you just see an increase in struggles. Everything from sort of performance anxiety to throwing up before you go and race, whatever form those issues take and however they reveal themselves for sure what we have are swimmers and athletes who aren't enjoying the sport as much as they should and they could and aren't performing often to the full potential so this project is really designed to inspire people to open up those conversations in your families in your clubs Think about and talk about the policies and procedures that are in place. Yes, we have a great governing body, but what can you do? What else can we do? And there's lots that always happens and always has happened at a grassroots level. So I'm hoping to inspire a movement that really gets creative and takes a look at how we can bring about some change now. And to do all of that, uh, I've got some experts I'm certainly not an expert so I've had to recruit some people who know what they're talking about here and we've got uh, Olympic swimmers Gemma Lowe and Ed Sinclair we have Claire Kerslake who is a welfare officer at Soundwell Swimming Club we've got Keith Oddie who is a independent safeguarding consultant Kike Anobi is a forensic psychiatrist. Jake Brown is a performance psychologist. And we have Dino Nicavelli, who is a solicitor who focuses on child abuse cases and has done a lot of work with sporting organizations. So throughout the documentary, we are going to be putting a number of questions to our panelists and I hope you enjoy their stories. They're amazing. And even just using those stories to as a, a platform to open up that conversation within your teams and within your families would be a terrific start. At the end of this, we want to make sure that we've inspired some real action, that it's not just a great conversation that ends there. We want to see people really exercising this muscle around mental health and being proactive about it. So we don't don't have to wait for there to be a problem that's often a misconception um if we equip our young athletes now with some of the tools that they need to be able to handle situations when they get into those challenging and pressured and difficult situations they'll just do better they'll just have the coping mechanisms and the tools to be able to respond in a way that keeps their mental health more intact so accompanying this documentary is a PDF ebook that has lots of notes about mental health. There's lots of free resources and template tools for clubs and uh, guidance for parents as well. So it's been quite vulnerable, really, for us to open up about this as a topic. It doesn't feel comfortable at all. But when I was deciding, should I do it? Should I not? I thought that's the problem. People don't talk about mental health. Um, so we're talking about it. And I hope it makes a difference and gives you some ideas on how to get started. So my name is Gemma Jarvis. Uh, in the swimming world, I was known as Gemma Lowe because uh, I got married to another swimmer, Callum Jarvis, um, who just retired from swimming last year. Um, and during my swimming career, I swam in two Olympic Games. So I swam in Beijing 2008 
uh, and London 2012. Uh, so a home game, so absolutely amazing. Um, I broke a British record, which I still have, and the 200 metres butterfly um, short course. Um, and obviously, I had quite a long career from being in a swimming club, first starting out as a young swimmer, um, did all the international elite competitions, so World Championships, Commonwealth Games, Europeans, Olympic Games, made Olympic finals, uh, went through that whole journey. Um, lots of ups and downs, as you can imagine. Um, and then I retired from competitive sport in 2016 at the age of 26. Um, and now coming out of swimming, I really enjoy passing on my experience as a swimmer um, and helping you know young swimmers with their journey and hope to get the best out of theirs and hopefully have a happy, exciting journey because that's what sport is about. Um, Kike Anunobi, I work as a forensic and general adult psychiatrist um, in the UK. I work in Doncaster. Um, I've been a psych training and working in psychiatry since 2003. So I have over 20 years experience, about 20 years experience um, working in mental health. Um, I've had a broad-based training in both adult, um, old age, child psychiatry. I decided to specialize in both adult and forensic psychiatry. Um, currently, I work in a forensic mental health unit where you have people that have committed serious crimes, but the crimes were committed because of their mental ill health. Um, I have a big passion for mental health. I, I believe that anybody and everybody can be helped to live optimally, as optimal as they can for their own mental health. I believe that we all have it within us to live life well. And the mental, nobody is, um, nobody is um, exempt from mental ill health. At one time or the other, we would all go through it. But that everybody has the ability to live happily and at peace and to have mental health. I want to, one of my life's missions is to give it the stigma that surrounds mental health. Um, my name's Claire. I'm uh, one of the uh, welfare officers at Sangwell Swimming Club. Um, I'm newly appointed, um, just been in post about four weeks. Um, but I've been a part of the swimming club for nine years or so, one of those roles as a coach. Um, I'm no longer coaching and saw the opportunity as a welfare officer and it sits very much in line with my day job. So in the day I work in a secondary school um, as part of the safeguarding team. So uh, yeah, so the two jobs cross over nicely. I'm Keith Eddy. Uh, I'm an independent safeguarding consultant. Um, essentially, my background has been a, a, as a retired uh, police officer. Uh, I did 30 plus years, um, most of which was actually spent in uh, child protection, child safeguarding, uh, dealing with um, uh, multiple kind of area and, and lower level concerns, but going up through kind of um, significant concerns to children, more significant concerns involving uh, all the abuse uh, categories, etc. Also dealing with uh, multiple child murders uh, and suspicious child deaths on, uh, on children. Um, over the years, I've dealt with quite uh, a number of uh, cases within sport, uh, particularly. Uh, by those involved with you know, people in positions of trust, etc. So, um, done an awful lot of work with uh, in, in a multi-agency forum. Uh, really, actually, I chaired uh, and, and helped set up the first London Smash, the multi-agency safeguarding hub. Um, so, worked on that for three years as well. Uh, I'm a serious case reviewer uh, for local authorities. Uh, more recently, um, I've since my retirement, I've been involved in specifically working with uh, a number of uh, you know, national uh, governing bodies in sport, both large national governing bodies and small uh, NGBs as well, uh, which have all got their own uh, issues and uh, and um, uh, demands on resources, etc. But um, it's been very enlightening actually doing that work uh, across that uh, that area. I also work in leisure for leisure facilities as well. Uh, so that's uh, that's kind of me. Um, I suppose one particular aspect is that I I was an age group swimmer. Um, I also compete regularly uh, in Masters. I'm a former um, joint British and European record holder uh, in Masters swimming. Um, so very much used to being around the pools and uh, still regularly trained. Uh, my name is Ed Sinclair. I am an ex-international swimmer. 
I swam Europeans, Worlds, and then went on to swim at the Olympic Games. My career in swimming was over 10 years, around 10 years. After I retired from swimming, I then went into coaching. I picked up my stopwatches and have been coaching ever since. So I've been coaching now for about 17 years. Uh, during that time frame, I've worked, I've been really lucky. I've worked in uh, elite academies. I've worked in clubs. I've worked in schools. So I've got a really good sort of understanding and, and knowledge over that period of, of um what the swimming is about especially in the uk and the structures i also do uh, also run a company called maximum performances we do swim consultancy we run swim clinics and we give back to the sport so we run uh, our workshops on technique we run our workshops on racing we run our workshops on mental health we run our workshops on lots of different areas of swimming and it's really really important i think for me just giving back to the sport that I'm absolutely passionate about. So my name is Dino Nocciavalli. I'm a lawyer and partner at Lead Ace Solicitors. I specialise in representing abuse survivors um, from different areas of society, but especially within sport. Yeah, so my name's Jake Brown. I'm a performance psychologist and founder of Mindframe Performance. So we're a sport and performance psychology consultancy that help people try and enjoy their sport first and foremost more, but also try and enhance their performance by helping them with mental tools, techniques, and running through different sessions to really help optimize their performance and how they view their sport and their perceptions around it. So a lot of people don't really know what sports psychology is. It's uh, it's a bit of an elusive area and don't actually know what it looks like. Um, so we work mainly online at the minute. We work with loads of different sports, loads of different issues. But the most common area that we work in is performance anxiety, especially with swimmers. So we often, I'd say around 80% of our work is helping individuals with performance anxiety to be able to better manage their thoughts, better manage their reactions, physiological response and behaviors. So like we said, they can improve their performance and improve their enjoyment as well. Well, to simplify, when I talk to people who are not psychiatrists, I always tell them, okay, what does physical health mean to you? For some people, it's absence of physical illness, which is correct. For some people, it's the ability to live well, even though they have a physical illness, you know. And the same thing with mental health. The brain and the mind is just another organ of the body. And... Just like the liver, the kidney, the heart, it, it is exposed to stressors, which can make it unwell. So that's what causes mental health, the stressors that the brain and the mind is exposed to, you know. So that, sh that should just take away the stigma because if, you, if we don't get ashamed because of we have hypertension, why should we be ashamed because we have depression or because one has bipolar affective disorder? But to define mental health, my definition is that it's a state of mental well-being that enables human beings to cope with the stresses of life. Life comes with stresses. Once you're alive, you would have stress, you know. And when we're able to cope with the stresses that come with life, we're able to realize our abilities. We can learn well, we can work well, and we can contribute to our environment. So it's a state of mental well-being that enables us to live life effectively and well. That is what good mental health is. So I guess mental health, when you think about it, if you compare it to physical health, um, it's obviously really important because it's whether you are mentally healthy and are happy, and I would describe it as being stable um, and being able to you know, look after yourself mentally um, and, you know, knowing what is healthy for you as a person, um, sort of being positive um, and motivating yourself, not putting yourself down. For me, it's hard to describe because I think for everyone, mental health will be different. But when you compare it to the word physical health, um, you know, everyone knows, sort of knows what physical health is, uh, being healthy, um, doing sport, keeping fit, eating healthily, 
Um, and then mental health hasn't been talked about much, I don't think, um, over the last you know a couple of decades compared to physical health, as I've talked about. So, um, you know, mental health, I think, is quite personal as well. Um, but it is sort of being in a safe place um, so you can be your normal self, feel like that you are you. Um, that's how I would describe it. So um, for me in, in swimming, it's, it's, an, it's a pretty new thing for me. Um, part of my day job every day, we talk about mental health of our students. But in the swimming world, it's, it's a new, new thing that's come to our attention and as society now. And it's making sure we get the best version out of our swimmers and part of their mental health. And their, it's just as important as their physical health. And as a club, we, you know, we want to be at the front of this and make sure when the times arise that we know what to do or where to signpost our swimmers to if, if their mental health isn't where it should be and we're not getting the best out of them and they're not being the best versions of themselves. So for me, mental health is a happy swimmer who enjoys their training and um, when times are tough, they can turn to the adults around them who they trust, who can guide them and to make sure they're getting the best out of themselves. I mean, uh, clearly everyone has mental health. Um, it's just that you know each one of us will go through different stages of uh, how well that's performing for us uh, and how you know poorly at sometimes that that performs for us. So, and I think uh, for me a lot of it around kind of the sport aspect, most of the kind of involvement in sport is actually very positive, has very positive effects on on mental health. Um, and I've seen that you know my 50 years involvement within you know swimming itself uh, has has reinforced that. Um, but of course, there are times which, um, you know, uh, our individuals, our own mental health can be affected by our own individual circumstances, be they, you know, within a you know, home circumstance, be within uh, another environment that we're regularly involved in, you know, be it sport or another area of leisure and other effects on life. So, uh, and of course, they can be, you know, significantly devastating, um, you know, uh, it can be, you know, relatively uh, a relatively lower end of, of mental health issues where, you know, all the family support and GP support, etc., that, that can be uh, can, can help individuals and and friends and uh, so I, I think it's a you know it's a variable journey. Um, we're all going to experience sort of a different you know different challenges to our own mental health over over periods of time. So lots of my clients sadly um, have mental health. Um, injuries because of the abuse they suffered, uh, whether as children or as adults. Uh, often it's been uh, not been treated for a number of years because the inherent difficulties about abuse, especially uh, within sport, there are inherent barriers for all abuse survivors. Um, and where abuse has taken place by someone in a position of trust, there often are difficulties. The issue within sport is that lots of my clients are very good at that specific sport. And for them to drop out, especially if it's going to be a potential career for them, it is inherently difficult, if not prohibitive, actually. Um, and instead, they have to try to struggle with this. We still have an issue within sport whereby it's still a barrier to talk about your mental health, about struggles, about issues you face. And if you do talk about them, there's still this stigma, uh, which can um, stick around with you for the rest of your career. So m mental health to me is is just is about being um, aware of you of how you feel at certain points um, and being able to express those feelings to others. Uh, we are human beings, after all. We are going to get points of high, points of low. But it's it's about understanding what mental health is. Back when I was swimming, it wasn't really talked about at all. I think we've moved on a lot uh, in terms of what mental health is and and we've still got a long, long way to go. And the fact that we're having this conversation today is a, is a massive step forward, um, trying to understand and help young people, young swimmers, especially in this situation, to become more open on conversation, uh, talk a little bit more about how they feel at certain times and really help them and guide them through uh, their mental health.
Yeah, it's a really good question. So for me, mental health is something that everyone has, right? Mental health isn't just the absence of a problem. Mental health is also being happy as well. I think mental health is something that's connected to your physical health as well. You know, they're not entirely separate. How you feel in yourself, how your fitness is, how your physical health is also relates massively to your mental health as well. So I see mental health as something that's holistic and also something that affects everybody. Even if we don't have a problem, we still have a mental mental health and it still massively affects massively affects our life. So from my experience, um, I didn't say that I actually went to the University of Florida and swam and spent a few years out there. Um, and as probably as a lot of us know, the Americans thrive on sport. Uh, they seem to get a lot of things right. Um, and they just have this sort of you know, atmosphere where they believe they're the best and they love what they're doing. They work hard and they're really positive and believe they're number one. Um, and anything that isn't that doesn't seem right. Um, so it's definitely something to learn from the Americans in sport, um, that they just have that, we're having fun, we're the best, we're going to do this, everything's great. Um, and that's something that you should be practicing every day, I believe. Um, I was a sort of preparation athlete, so I was always, always, always looking for ways to get that extra you know, 1% out of my performance. So I did look into uh, sports psychology and mental health and uh, I didn't have a clue as a swimmer. I didn't understand it at all. I, I was very lucky, uh, I guess, to have some good coaching and good mentoring. So when I did struggle with my mental health, I had that conversation with uh, my coach and, and the people around me. And I think that that really, really helped me. But I would say probably less <clears throat> less than 10% of what I did. Um, it was going on around me and, and a, a weird story. One of my, one of the guys that beat me in some, in my, beat my British record in uh, the 200 freestyle, he was actually having a sports psychologist at the time. And I remember looking at it and thinking, wow, like I can't do anything more physically. I can't do anything more in the land training, in the gym, in the pool. You know, how has he gone and, and, and beaten my record? Is it, I remember asking myself, is it that that he's mentally tougher than me? And is he, is he able to tap into things that I wasn't able to when I went into those scenarios of, of self-doubt, when I got myself down? So, yeah, it was really, it was, it was not a lot that I did. Uh, most ex-athletes that you, you're going to speak to and, that I speak to some of my peers always look back and think, wow, I wish I'd have done a little bit more on, um, on the, on the mental side and trying to get myself a little bit more prepared for different scenarios. I mean, physically everyone that lines up all eight people at the international competitions, physically, they're pretty similar nowadays. Um, but I think the thing that really separates uh, the, the the guys and the girls that go really far is the is the mental resilience and being able to tap into that that resource. A bit about myself personally, so I've always been obsessed with sport, and I use that word very deliberately. I obsessed with sport, so I've played so many different sports growing up. And for me, it was always the, the psychological side that let me down. So I had a, a negative experience with a coach when I was playing academy football and when I was younger, really horrible coach that actually put me off playing football. It made me made me leave that set up as I was looking to try and pursue a professional career. And that experience I had with a coach didn't just make me leave, you know, that set up. But I actually stopped playing almost altogether. And for me, I think that was that was really difficult. And look, I've I've met people who've had way worse experiences, but I think it's really sad when you're so passionate about something and you love it, but someone else is ruining that for you. So I had a really negative experience with a coach and then also with my golf as well. So again, the football career packed in and I, I was trying to pursue a career in golf so looking at a u.s scholarship and looking to to hopefully become a, a tour golfer but it was always the psychological side that let me down so it wasn't so much a negative experience there 
but it was anxiety and competitions. It was becoming really nervous. And, you know, when it really mattered, ultimately I, I couldn't perform. And no matter how much technical coaching I had, no matter how much I worked on my fitness or other areas around it, I still couldn't perform when it matters. You know, I would like to say 100% physical and zero mental, um, especially in the beginning of a uh, swimming career, sporting career. Um, and then it might slightly change, 95% physical, 5% uh, mental, which, um, which when I've thought about it is crazy because you always hear on competition day, it's 90% mental, 10% physical, um, but hang on a minute, we train 100% mental, I mean physical, 100% physical and well, 0% mental. So, yeah, it's a bit crazy. You know, as a, as a young swimmer, that when I stopped doing PBs, that was like a real challenge for me. I, I couldn't believe it. And I, and I remember it absolutely clear as uh, we went to a sort of regional competition and I swam a couple of races and I was one second, two second off my PBs and I didn't understand what was going on, you know. And all the things in my mind were like, I'm going backwards, I'm not good enough, um, I'm going to quit, right, you know, this is going to be my last competition ever. Um, and what I did then is sat down with my coach and said, you know, what's happening? And they explained to me all the things, you know, you're physically changing, um, you know, you, your, your training has changed and, and all these sort of things. And once I started to understand it a little bit more, it really, really helped me with my with my sort of coming through that period. I think that's such a hard period as as any swimmer will go through. It's, it's called a sort of plateau period. But every swimmer goes through it, no matter what sort of level you are, even whether you're county or just below county level or you're moving up to regional and national or international, every swimmer will go through those, those periods. And it's having those kind of coping mechanisms are really important. Absolutely. And it's even more dangerous in kids because they speak a different language from us adults. Now, these kids, we, we know that up to the age of 21, the kid's brain is still developing. I mean, the, we think the frontal lobe that's able to make executive decisions is not fully developed until they are 21. And even then, it's still growing. So these kids don't even have the words to express the way they are feeling. These kids have been taught that, you know, it has to be stiff upper lip, chin up, you don't complain, you just get it done. Or, and they may even think if I complain, if I express the way I'm feeling, I mean, I may lose my position in this team. People may think I'm not serious or dedicated enough. So they just climb it all in. And even kids that are expressive, they express it in different ways. So you might find a kid who, who is very outgoing, suddenly becomes very reclusive. You can find a kid that just suddenly starts cutting themselves without reason, you know, self-harming. Um, you can find a kid becoming anorexic or eating too much. So you have to be on the alert. You have to know what to watch for. And unfortunately, just like if you tell me to go fly a plane now, I would have no idea what to do. Most people that are not trained in mental health don't have, even though they love these kids, even though they are good coaches or good parents, they may not know what to look out for. So I think that's the beginning. We have to know what to look out for. We have to know the individual kid. So the way kid A will respond to a stressor is very different from the way kid B will respond to a stressor. And it has nothing to do with delivering. Some kids may be on top of their game, but they may be crashing internally. And um, with kids, I mean, I'm sure in, in the last 10 years, the rate of um, adolescent and young kids as young as seven, committing suicide, as I mean, it's alarming. I think it's, a, it's up to an epidemic proportion in my own books, you know. And um, it doesn't start in one day. A kid doesn't hang themselves or do something to hurt themselves in one day. It's been going on with time until they're unable to cope anymore. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I mean, and swimming is such an up and down sport. So you and we're so driven in in uh, times hitting a certain time a certain qualifying time county regional national 
And it's I get a lot of swimmers coming on my camp, and they do, and they and they say to me, "Oh, you know, coach, I haven't done a PB for six months. You know, I'm I'm not improving, but I'm training more and everything like that." And then it's just starting that conversation with them and saying, "Well, you know, have you looked? How are you feeling at certain points in your training?" How are you feeling after you've done your race? Are you getting really anxious? Are you ten are you tightening up? Um, it's just giving them the tools and the understanding. Um, you know, it's, it comes back to me of what I do, and part of the reason why I set up the camps uh, many years ago with a, an, another buddy of mine who we swam the Olympics together was to to help educate the next generation of, of kids coming through and 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 mental health is just a it's just a a huge area that you can just you, you can you can really really help so many young swimmers with it and just by starting the conversation you know what did you feel before the race did you did you feel sick did you feel nervous okay here are some coping coping mechanisms that you can use going forward and and taking the emphasis away or uh, from the out the outcome which is well, swimming is so outcome driven isn't it we we go we want to swim sub 30 seconds for 50 freestyle and we swim 30 seconds and it's like oh no and the, <laughs> the world has collapsed and we're never going to go sub 30 and it's and you know you as a coach the easiest thing in the world is when the swimmer hits the goal you know you're just like oh great they, they swam 29 seconds great okay off you go, let's work on the next race. But it's the swimmer that doesn't uh, hit that time and, and, and goes through that down and really gets down and their, and their mental health really takes a hit. It's then having the conversations, well, look, you know, maybe you were a bit, you know, you were focusing a bit too much on the time. Maybe you didn't focus on your, your processes, like your start and your underwaters and your finish. And, and that's what we try and do at Maximum Performance. We're not, we're not doing anything complex. We're just trying to help the kids to start the conversation, number one, and then build their confidence and understanding of where they need to be and what they need to focus on. Because as a as an ex-athlete, I have that understanding. I had a coach who would constantly make my life miserable. He would tell me things like, you're not good enough, or that I was letting the team down. And he even called me an attention seeker when I was extremely ill, and he refused to believe me. I was away at boarding school for swimming and all the friends that I made there never felt like true friends. And when I left, I barely got a true goodbye from anyone. I'm now back at the small club that I started at when I was eight and I'm still scarred. Um, I'm scared to do anything after all the pain that he caused me and that's quite a lot for only being 14. I think there has been people who, you know, uh, sadly have been the wrong people in that role. Um, I, I think most of the welfare officers that, uh, you know, and I'm lucky to have uh, spoken to an awful lot of them uh, over the periods of time. Uh, most of them are, you know, certainly well-meaning and some of them are very well trained because actually some are professionals in, in uh, you know, a child safeguarding field. Um, of course, you know, I myself have actually been, you know, in another sport, I've actually been uh, a welfare officer myself uh, for a, a, a football club. So I, I think, you know, there's a lot of well-meaning, there's a, there's a, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of good professionals around that, that actually perform that in a, in a volunteer basis. But of course, um, you know, the demands of their own jobs, the demands of um, uh, of the, the, the sport, you know, and swimming included uh, itself, uh, and uh, and the other aquatic sports mean that that role can be very demanding, um, and it, it could be that some people that actually are volunteering for the role don't actually you know fully appreciate the the demands. Actually, uh, I know there was a you know over a period of time there's a, a significant turnaround um, on the amount of people actually performing uh, the welfare officer role. Uh, I think that's reduced a little. Um, Obviously, you know, the best equipped people to do the job are the people that are, you know, under fully understand and perhaps are involved in child safeguarding, child protection um, uh, from the statutory agencies um, who perhaps fully, you know, more fully understand the demands of the role. Having said that, there's some excellent, excellent volunteers who are 
really, really good in the role and very, very supportive to children and families within clubs and, and do some excellent work. Um, but quite clearly, that's not, you know, that's not necessarily always the case. Um, sometimes there are compromises and, um, you know, historically, even perhaps some coaches or perhaps some people that uh, that aren't quite so receptive to the welfare officer role have performed that role. Um, but uh, it's um, yeah, so there are there are some gaps. Uh, certainly, I think training is is key for them, and uh, an honest uh, approach to uh, recruitment and making sure they're aware of the demands is also key to it. We would always always encourage uh, any welfare officer to, if they're, they're dealing with, uh, for example, a mental health issue for a child, to actually uh, involve the family as much as possible, give the advice to actually seek, you know, perhaps. Um, uh, organisations uh, like, uh, like you know GPs and and, uh, and uh, their local surgery to actually help them support, help them get referrals. We obviously know that the, there are significant demands and significant delays in um, uh, you know in provision of services currently across the country, and uh, uh, and, and some of those you know statutory services are, are very much delayed. Um, but we would always always encourage them to seek, you know, if they can, uh, advice where they can. There are a, a number of organisations that are really good about giving, you know, giving uh, specific advice around specific areas, uh, be it uh, self harm, for example, um, or eating disorders, etc. So there are specific organisations online, that, and that actually most national governing bodies have a, have a very good um, relationship and, and good. Um, uh, way of actually signposting these kind of positive services. It's, I suppose, some of the key issues where where organisations get it wrong is actually not speaking to the experts, perhaps not referring uh, concerns up the line as early as they they need. Um, you know, I've certainly had clubs that are dealing tried to deal themselves with you know quite serious cases, sexual assaults, etc., um, and uh, and significant mental health issues. Tried to deal with it themselves. Uh, without the expert support, really, and uh, and for me, the the key to it would be actually supporting those welfare officers and making sure that they can have somewhere to turn to, uh, rather than trying to deal with things themselves where things can go can go wrong. Young men between 15 and 24 years old are three times more likely to take their lives than female peers. RCPCH, state of child health. I think it is important that swimming clubs know what to do um, regarding strategies for mental health support as much as it is in schools. Uh, schools, we're a team, got loads of agencies that we can call upon when we need to. Whereas in a swimming club, it's it's a lot more isolated, smaller numbers, fewer experts, and it can feel quite a lonely place and, and know what to do. So having a clear strategy about what to do when situations arise is the whole reason I wanted to be part of this so as a as a club that we can um we're ready if something was to come ahead and we would know what to do so just being proactive rather than reactive the, the people that the leaders of this competitive sports are not even aware they're aware that that's the first question definitely I'm sure they're aware of it but they're not aware that these kids need help to cope with this pressure they assume that well they, they are strong kids and the parents think they are strong because these these kids are usually high achieving, very capable kids. So they just assume that they are okay. But I don't think any kid is okay. I don't think we can leave our kids and assume they are okay in this day we live in, even without competitive sports. And that makes competitive sports just makes it much more difficult for them. It's an incredibly tough journey, you know, for swimmers and. It's, but there are a lot of positives to take away from it as well. And I think sometimes it's hard for the swimmers to see the positives when they're in the thick of it. I think competitive sports, swimming, it brings discipline. It teaches the kids how to relate well to other kids. Um, there's a lot of good that comes with it. But we also have to acknowledge that there's a lot of stress sort of attached to it, you know, and it's not been addressed. I don't think it's been addressed enough. Even in the States, you know, we've had, if you look at popular news nowadays, you know, the gymnastics and all that, and it's not been addressed. And um, I'm always surprised that 
many of these kids, there no, there's no psychologist on board. There's no sports coach. I mean, I, when I talk about sports coach, a psychological coach, there's no support given to them. They don't have regular therapy, which should be part of what these kids are exposed to. When you have a swimming club of that level, they should be providing some sort of therapy for these kids. You know, they should be finding about their well-being. How are you doing? They should be one-to-one -one talks with the coach. I mean, footballers do, they do it. People, basketballers, they have all this. They have permanently employed psychiatrists, psychologists, life coaches for them. So what about kids that can't even handle that kind of stress or why are they not being provided? You know, is it a matter of funding? I think it's a matter of ignorance because if, if the people in charge realize how important it is, it's not only to the advantage of the kids, it's to the advantage of the swim clubs and the competitive thing for them to have to pay attention to the mental health of these kids. I do actually think it makes them, the swimmers, an all round better person, prepares them for adult life. I think if they can, with the right support, have a very successful swimming journey, I think it, they go on to be very successful adults with the right support and we don't leave anybody behind. So actually, that's why you know I, I specialise in abuse and sport cases. So, so you know, obviously, I'm a lawyer, um, but I love sport. Um, I play sport, whether it's football, tennis, um, whether I'm running or swimming or cycling. I watch sport nearly every day. Uh, I think it's a great thing. I really want to support it. And I want it to exist, but and it's a massive but. It can't be more important than life and death. Medals can't be more important than the well-being of our children. Sport must be safe. Sport is there to enjoy. It's supposed to be of benefit for society, for the individuals, for social social well-being. That's what it's there for. But it must be safe. Because if it isn't safe, then it shouldn't exist in its current state. And I think that we need to do a lot more to make sure that everyone who participates can be safe, can do it without fear of abuse or repercussion. And I think that mental health is a key aspect of all of that. I think it will make a big impact. You will find more athletes that do well, even when they stop being athletes. You will find more athletes that are uh, both physically and mentally competent, you know. You find less athletes becoming drug addicts, using alcohol, or not just coping. You'll find happier athletes because what of when the swimming stops? Even when, the, when they are swimming, it's just a small aspect of their lives. They're going to be children, they're going to be siblings, they're going to be parents one day, you know. What about, about those other aspects of their lives? I think, I, I think I'm bold enough to say that we are going to raise athletes that are going to be in trouble if we don't take care of their mental health. You know, they won't, one, they won't, they, they may, may, may be more difficult for them to achieve their full, full potential as athletes. So they can, I'm not saying it's impossible because you've had athletes that have not had mental health care, you know, but it would be much easier if attention is paid. You know, there'll be more of a whole person because our lives are made up of compartments, you know. We're not just athletes, we're we are students, we're parents, we're husbands, wives, lovers, children, you know, where we'll get a job one day. And if we don't, I think it's mental, good mental health is what binds all of those things together, you know. It's not about, you have lots of very rich people, lots of very successful people who are deeply unhappy, who have poor mental health. So it's not just doing well. Doing well doesn't... It's not synonymous with good mental health. That is a very good question. Um, and, you know, I can say absolutely. I think it would. But then you can't say that for everybody. Everybody is different. Um, I can only say from my own experiences. Um, and when I think about it a lot, um, obviously I was pretty successful in my career. And a lot of young swimmers would be like, oh, amazing. Uh, she achieved so much. But... I was actually quite disappointed with the way my swimming career ended, which, you know, when you come out of it, it's a bit ridiculous. But um, when I was young, uh, you know, in the small swimming club, as you are when you start out, um, I used to get super, super nervous. So to the point where I was actually physically throwing up behind the blocks that I was so nervous. So 
I used to have this blue sports drink when I was young, as you do, just thinking it's good for you, giving you energy. Um, so I, I remember a few times I used to actually <laughs> physically throw up behind the blocks and it would be this blue liquid from this blue <laughs> sports drink. <laughs> and then I would actually get in and swim okay. And sometimes I swam PBs. Um, but it's a bit weird, right, that that happened. And then, but nothing was said about it. It was just something that I did sometimes. But then when I think about it, it makes me think it was maybe something engraved in me when I was young that I was so nervous and I was maybe assuming that the performance of swimming defined me as a person and it meant so much and I was going to be a failure if it didn't go right. So I got so nervous I was throwing up, <laughs> which was ridiculous. And then, but nothing was ever addressed. Just carried on as you do. Um, but then that sort of did carry on throughout my career a little bit. I wasn't throwing up all the time. That sort of stopped for whatever reason it stopped. Um, but later on in my career, when obviously pressure got more because I was being more successful, um, I used to get super, super nervous. Uh, there was times where I was in Olympic finals. There was a time I went in going in first into a world championships final. Um and I never quite got onto the podium, which is what I was sort of disappointed about in my career. Um, but I was super, super nervous. Um, more towards the end of my career, I used to get so nervous that I would get pins and needles in my fingers. Um, and sometimes it would cramp up and I used to dread getting that. It was just not enjoyable. But then it makes me think that if something had maybe been put in place when I was younger... Um, obviously, I was super nervous, thrown up behind the blocks. If something was put in place then to sort of, you know, get into my head that swimming the sport doesn't define you. Um, you're doing it to have fun, uh, get the best you can out of it. And maybe if that was practiced a bit more mentally, you know, I might have performed better later on in my career. And who knows what other swimmers are out there and other, you know, young athletes who are very, very talented and have the capability to work very hard but aren't working on, you know, mental health and how sport doesn't define you, you should be having fun. And um, how many of the athletes are there that could be, you know, next future Olympians, you know, world champions or whatever, but don't get to that point because they struggle mentally. And that's just something that I can relate to from mine. I was crazy nervous when I was young and obviously it wasn't addressed properly throughout my career. Um, so, yes, I think it would have a huge impact on a lot of swimmers and athletes. I think it will make a big, very big difference. In fact, I've always said it that we shouldn't wait till kids are adults before we start teaching them about mental health. By that stage, it's a bit too late. We have to start teaching them now. Uh, the, more, the more people that are aware of support for children, uh, the more people that are aware of, you know, uh, you know even things like self-harm. Um, clearly, you know, there's certain areas of mental health that are, might be more apparent in certain other sports so you know swimming be one of them clearly due to the physical nature etc but the more support that is available to people who are around the child includes welfare officers and parents etc um the, the more opportunity to support that child the better so you know yeah it's, it's absolutely key to make sure that people are aware and are aware there are different resources out there to, in order to try to support the child albeit there are limitations on kind of some of the statutory support services. I think the key thing, and it's something I've campaigned for for a long time, is that we do need an independent sports ombudsman. I think that each sport has a different set of regulations and rules, uh, conventions and customs, and culture, importantly. And sports can be difficult. To be the best, you have to train hard and be resilient and persevere and obviously that is true and right at the same time we have to protect the athletes which are involved um, an independent sports ombudsman would make sure hopefully that every single sport had the same standard and duty of care which doesn't apply to the current time every single person who's involved in that sport could feel that they can report to someone who's independent who's not in the sport and they'd be treated fairly and objectively um, and um, the other factor which is important is that there's different forms of abuse and different levels of abuse and what every sport should be doing is trying to eradicate all forms and all levels as soon as they possibly can 
from low level concerns and allegations all the way up to the most serious and signposting and supporting where they can, whether it's to the police, whether it's to therapy and support agencies, rather than trying to keep it internal, which often happens for far too long. Um, where there's been a breakdown in trust because there's been abuse, they really should be trying to support that athlete and signpost into others who are often better placed to assist and support that individual. And there's no, I guess, no official procedure in place um, with how to start helping with, you know, how what mental state you're in before racing. Um, and for me, I was if I was threw up behind the blocks and then I swam well, then it was a sort of brushed aside. Um, but it's not quite right, is it, to be thrown up behind the blocks? Um, but uh, people, I mean, the staff, parents probably don't know, but just because you don't know doesn't mean you should just brush it off and forget it. Um, because a lot of situations, it might not be okay. Um, I think even just talking about it, Andrea, would probably be a start. It, it, it is going to make such a difference. Um, the amount of swimmers that, that, that stop swimming because they don't understand you know, what's happening and because they didn't swim PBs, they didn't get selected for a team, they didn't get a medal, they didn't get a final. If that education is there and um, around mental health, I mean, that's just one scenario, right? Just around mental health is going to be a massive positive effect for the, for the generation now and for the future generations in, in swimming. I think, I think it's, it's just going to be so, so, so important to have those things in place. Um, I mean, I'm going back to my career, not a lot was in place. Now, you know, quite some years later, it, it seems that we're going in the right direction, but we've got a lot of work to do um, in getting these, these guidelines and these things in place. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think the conversations are happening so much more. Uh, we're, we're talking today um, on you know, the communication, the ability to communicate is, is getting a lot, lot better. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that it's going to be, the thing is, I think with mental health, it's not just, and, and this must be sort of, you know, really important to get across, but it's not just one meeting about I feel down and then you go away and you work on it. It's a constant process of having meetings having conversations and over a period of time then it's it's increasing your uh, getting your mental health to a better state i think it's really really important sports psychology is often wrongly looked upon that you only need to speak to someone when something's wrong when we're anxious or when we're we need to control our emotions or or it's reached such a point that it's got so bad that then finally we'll get in touch and, and reach someone. And I think this is the wrong way to look at it. You know, sports psychology can benefit everyone. It can benefit all performers, whether you're feeling super confident and on top of your game or whether you're feeling terrible and having a really tough time with things at the minute. It's important that we don't look to sports psychology when something goes wrong. And it's only this this fix it mentality around it. It's very important to be proactive with things, right? When it's going well, well, why is it? What are the psychological aspects that you can improve and you can you can replicate what you know, what are the factors that are reliable, repeatable, and dependable that make you good? So you can stay at the top of your game for as long as possible. You know, sports psychology is often something that's reactive. It's a solution when something's going wrong. And I think the shift that we'll see in the next few years, and I think it's happening now, but sports psychology isn't just about dealing with problems. Sports psychology is something that can be proactive. It's something that can be preventative. It's important to have these tools in place, ready to use in case something goes wrong or just ready to use to enhance your performance anyway, rather than a last minute solution, a last throw of the dice, to try and improve or deal with a problem that's arisen. Sports psychology is something that we should be more proactive with. The brain is a muscle too. If you don't, if you don't train it to be strong, it will be weak. Nobody becomes strong by accident. We either become strong by experience or we teach ourselves to be strong.
kids are quite different from adults. You have to pay attention. And I think it starts at home because nobody knows a kid as well as the parent of that kid. I mean, I'm talking about parents that are engaged, parents that know their loving parents that know their children. You know, you know your kid. You know when something is different. You know, some kids are quiet, they don't talk much, you know. In fact, like my own kid, I'll be more alarmed if he starts talking all of a sudden a lot. I'll be a bit alarmed. What's going on here? You know, because it's not very, it's not somebody that talks a lot. But if you have a kid that's quite chatty and happy and outgoing, and suddenly this kid becomes reclusive, doesn't talk much, even if it's an alternate behavior, it's a good thing to ask. And you don't just walk up to them, what's wrong with you now? That's not going to work, you know. You know your you know your own kid. You know what's going to bring them out of their shell. You know you you have to learn the skill. And their books like their books. I read those books when I my my own kid became a teenager. Even though I'm a psychiatrist, there's a book book I like how to talk so your kids will listen, and how to listen so your kids will talk. There's one for teenagers too. I read that book because it really helped me to understand the language of my kid, to understand the approach. You know, and I know my kid. I know when he's unhappy. I know when it's excited and it's happy. And sometimes if you ask them what's going on, they won't talk, but just give them room, you know, lay a background of non-judgmental, you know, that they, you can come to me for anything. I don't care how bad it is, just come and talk to me or talk to somebody else you trust, you know. So if a kid's just a, a sudden change in behavior, you have to look into it. If a kid doesn't want to, eat anymore, there's a change in diet, you know, it's like that maybe the kid that has a good appetite suddenly stops eating or suddenly starts eating a lot, you know, or suddenly starts sleeping a lot or not sleeping, or there's a change in, um, in they're doing well at school or doing well in the sports. It may be nothing, but it, it, it has to be looked at. Or the kid suddenly starts, you know, misbehaving, um, smoking, using drugs, you know, or promiscuity. Now, why it's a bit difficult is that even kids that are not, that there's nothing going on. It's a, these things happen in teenage, in teenage years, as kids grow up, influences different things. And that's why I think kids at that level, apart from parents, apart from um, um, coaches that are engaged with them, I think these kids need to be provided with somebody who provides mental health therapy for them. Well, Andrea, I don't. How do clubs know? I think is there, there should be a procedure in place of speaking to the athlete, speaking to the parent. Is there someone they go to? I mean, they don't know if something's wrong. Um, it could easily be ignored, which is the worrying thing. Easily brushed aside. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how they would know, Andrea. I think it is it's all about knowing knowing your athletes um starting the conversation as, as small as small as it is how are you feeling today how was the training session and if it's that constant um they're they're constantly down or, or you know you can see you can sort of sense it and it's that constant um there I think it's really important that the swimmer feels they can communicate as well there's 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 nothing harder i suppose as a young person if you are struggling with something to talk to someone you know have a conversation just tell your coach look you know i did I, i'm feeling a little bit down I'm, I'm not quite you know feeling that my training is going well it's hard to do as a as a as a young swimmer and a, a young person but it's having those tools to uh, to start that conversation and once you start that conversation and you know and then the coach is aware and then you can try and, you know, the coach can then try and work on ways of you know, identifying that it isn't just, you know, a one off. There's something repeating. There's something that happening. And then they can then go down the channels that they do need to to get some support for this this person, whether those support systems are in place as, as much as they should. Um, is always another conversation. Um, but I think as long as, you know, the things that, that, I mean, the fact that we are here today talking about this is is a massive positive, right? Because we're, we're starting to build awareness that in swimming clubs, especially, obviously, that's what, what we're talking about, 
that there are these issues on a, on a daily basis and what do we need to sort of put in place to to help our children be confident to start the conversation help the coaches to know the signs and what to look for and then look into the processes of how we help this individual and I, and I want to stress individual because uh, everyone's different you know I I trained uh, you know I've trained a lot of people over my of my time as a coach and every single person is slightly different in terms of their personality I've coached grumpy swimmers I've coached happy swimmers you know just because someone's happy it might you know, it, it might mean them sort of masking their mental health if they're grumpy sometimes you know they're just they're just grumpy all the time so it's it's knowing and identifying those things as a as a as a coach and then putting those processes in place yeah so it's not just anxiety for me i guess the easiest way to describe it is anxiety would be an extreme form of nerves right so you have you know your negative thoughts start to spiral you might have a a really negative physiological response where you start to feel heavy and your your heart rate goes up and you sweat extreme cases and we see this quite a lot in swimming is individuals being sick unfortunately and this is it's, it's a horrible experience for someone to go through and unfortunately when we've had that experience in the past we become almost anxious about that happening again so you know, sports psychology isn't just about dealing with anxiety, but maybe a, an example to give of how we would treat someone with anxiety. anxiety. Performance anxiety shows up in many different ways. So it might look very different to other people. It might be around excessively high standards that they have from themselves. So something, a common pattern that we see in performance anxiety is perfectionism. And unfortunately, swimming is a, a sport that that lends itself to, to perfectionism we're always looking for that extra millisecond it's a sport that's based on outcomes and times and pbs and achievements and that can drive a lot of these worries about needing to be perfect and needing to get everything right performance anxiety might also look like the fear of letting people down letting your coaches down perhaps letting your parents down because not even if your parents are massively supportive even if they don't put any pressure on you and they just want to see you happy young children junior athletes even adults can still experience anxiety because they worry about letting them down they want to impress people they want to make their family and their friends proud and this can cause some of the symptoms of anxiety as well so it does show up in lots of different ways and it's very important not to just group someone and just treat them under the umbrella term of performance anxiety because it shows up in different ways and it looks very different to different people but it's important to kind of dig deeper into where this is coming from what the symptoms are any causes any different triggers so you fully understand how you can go about supporting that individual in the best way my 17 year olds were asked if they had ever hurt themselves in an attempt to end your life, 7% replied yes. When asked if they had ever self-harmed during the previous year, 24% responded that they had. The Millennium Cohort Study. For me, I think, you know, having been a, an age group swimmer and, and, and still competing alongside, clearly I see a, a lot of um, a lot of athletes. Um, my advice would be to actually speak to somebody. Um, you know, it, there are people around. Make your make sure that kind of you know you speak to parents uh, if you can. Uh, speak to you know a peer. Speak to somebody that who you trust at a position. You know, potentially somebody in a position of trust at the club, uh, and that may be the welfare officer. Um, of course, not every welfare officer can uh, can attend uh, sessions all the time, etc. But you know, any any person that you trust, it might be a coach, it might be somebody a poolside helper, but speak to somebody. That that is the key to communication because um, once somebody knows the early stages of something that's happening, uh, people can help. You know, people are genuinely want to support. You know, those that you know perhaps might you know be self harming. The stance is not to actually bar you from the sport in any way. The, 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 the stance should be to actually encourage you to continue to come to, to the club and actually see your, see your friends uh, and involve yourself in the activities which you want to be part of. 
um, and a club should be supporting that. Um, so really, it's actually making sure that you communicate with somebody, speak to somebody. Obviously, there are um, if you if there are a specific uh, area of concern that you've got, there are websites you know that could be signposted to you as well. So um, and you know uh, one thing I suppose I want to reassure uh, athletes really and young athletes is that actually uh, the key to it is actually that the organisation, the governing body, the club itself should keep that information co uh, confidential uh, and shouldn't be circulating that information. So it will be a very, very limited number of people that know, but will still be able to support you. So it won't be club chat. It won't, you know, everybody won't be told about this. Um, you know, it's a very confined group of people that will know, but they're there to support you. And it's, and it's, I think that's massive. It's making sure as a welfare officer, I'm visible at the club. People know who I am and it's being able to, for somebody to say, oh, yeah, I know you need to go and talk to her. Go and have a word with Claire. You know, that's that's the key thing. And, and never judge, never assume, never put, you know, make assumptions about things. It's, you know, every every swimmer's story would be very different. And so hopefully, you know, that there will be different solutions as well, which would vary depending on the swimmer and the situation they're in. I think possibly, yes, they are. Um, because, I mean, when you're young, you're learning so much all the time. You're still sort of freaking yourself out. Um, you've got so much going on, obviously, with school, college, um, all the hormones going on. You know, when you're young, you're comparing yourself to everyone, your body's changing. Um, and then obviously to throw the sport into it, um, all that competitive side. Um, I mean, I'd like to think that competitiveness is a positive way. Um, but for some young athletes, you know, if they don't know how to handle disappointments, are they just going to keep putting themselves down, lose their confidence? Um, I guess because you're always sort of, you're still growing and figuring yourself out and learning. Um, and there's so much going on um, when you're growing up. School, friends, um, sport, body changing, friends and sports. Um, do, you, do your friends like you in school? Um, do you have time to hang out with friends in school because you're doing sports? Um, so, yeah, it's hard to say. It's definitely um, more susceptible in young athletes, but... Um, when you think of it like that, then yes, probably. My role has been in, in managing many, many cases, you know, hundreds and hundreds of cases uh, over the last eight to ten years within various sports. Um, is that uh, I can understand um, the views on that, on the increase of uh, uh, around sort of mental health issues. Um, for me, I think we've seen a good deal of an increase since actually uh, since, since lockdown. Um, you know, since we've had the COVID crisis, um, you know, there's been it's perhaps become more apparent uh, within sport. Uh, now, hopefully, uh, there's a there's a route to actually try to deal with that and be and sport to be more receptive to um, the issues that people are actually going through. Um, but certainly, I've seen seen an increase since uh, since lockdown. Gemma's story and journey is is a good example of how that swimmers have to go above and beyond the average child, and it, just getting through a day to day in school is is hard enough. Let alone start the school day at four thirty, train hard, feed yourself, make sure you're ready to train and do school, and that is immense. And we ask our swimmers a lot. Of, to do that um, and it's just making everybody around them understand what we're asking of them to do and I'm always blown away how people are able to open up you know and talk about their mental health problems and um, one thing that I've learned over the years is that everybody nobody's exempt no matter how, they, how, how good and shiny it looks on the outside Lots of people are going through it. And when we give those kind of talks, we normalize it. We remove yeah. the stigma and the shame. And people open up when they realize that I'm not alone. It's not just me because it's easy for a kid or even an adult to think, oh, I'm the only one going through this. It's just me. Something must be wrong with me. I'm so ashamed of it. All my other, my other colleagues and my peers, they're very strong. Nothing is happening in their lives. But it's not true. 
just because they're not talking about it. So I think that's a good way of doing it. I mean, maybe if it's once a fortnight or once a month, have kids come to either do it by Zoom like we're doing now, or even meet up with the kids. Let's have a talk, you know, open discussion, like kind of thing. Somebody will give a talk, then throw the floor open and invite kids to talk. You talk about your own experience, or you bring an athlete, talk about his or her own experience. You'll be surprised at how these kids will open up when they realize that I am not alone. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And that's a good way of doing it, you know. Bring somebody to talk. I mean, do you know that investment banks and Fortune 500 companies, they have in-house psychologists, sometimes psychiatrists, that give regular talks to these people because they realize that for these adults to achieve their maximum potential at work, which will do the company good. They have to have intact mental health. So companies wow. are taking it seriously now. They pay for, for them to go to psychiatrists. Even psychiatric hospitals, we have therapists. We have an external counselor that will say, okay, this is independent from the hospital. Our staff can go there. As a psychiatrist, we are encouraged to have regular therapy. You know, Even a psychiatrist, we are encouraged to do that regularly. You know, so I think it's a good thing. It's um, it will have lots of benefits, not only for the kids, for them as athletes, but even for their for the for their competing for either the country or the club. You know, so I think it's a win-win situation if that is done. Some of the um, some of the environments uh, around clubs or, or be they sort of uh, training schemes, etc don't necessarily encourage, uh, don't actively discourage, but they won't, you know, the, the environment itself won't necessarily encourage parents to be be around all the time, be present at the sessions. There might not be, you know, public viewing areas, et cetera. So for me, uh, the key is actually if, if a parent feels something that is not quite right, then we act on that. You know, for me, is if, if something doesn't feel right uh, about a, an arrangement that we've got or something, the child said something, our own children have said something, it doesn't feel quite right. It's explore it with the child, and then actually, if it is if it is an issue, then actually explore it with the club because the club should be open. Any well-run club should welcome questions from parents uh, about the welfare of their own children. Um, yeah, I, you know, a, anything which actually, if if clubs are actively barring people from actually viewing what's going on, that for me would raise a red flag. Uh, those kind of things. So, but. Um, you know, there's a lot of pressure at the moment um, uh, and a lot of pressure on governing bodies, quite rightly, to um, make sure that forbidden conduct, i.e. You know, harassment or humiliation of children, doesn't occur. Um, so the sport, you know, sports in general are going the right way to actually bring in those kind of um, you know, mandatory reporting, for example, and those kind of measures to make sure that people do report. So there's a, there's a really, really strong thrust to, to actually make sure that people do speak up, do communicate. Uh, I'm aware that there can be uh, parents can worry about, you know, upsetting a coach, upsetting, you know, if if there were questions about that coach's attitude or communication or ability, et cetera. But actually, you know, we need to speak up because uh, the problems start compounding themselves if we don't say something and we're just bystanders. Yeah, so the, the first session is what we call a needs analysis. So essentially asking lots of questions, getting to know that individual, getting to know wider factors around them so we can really build up a bigger picture to fully understand maybe why they're experiencing the reactions that they are and maybe where they're coming from. We have to be really cautious in psychology because I think especially with, with youngsters, when they hear the word psychology, they can freak out they can feel like we might be trying to read their mind or laying them down on a chaise long and delving into their deepest and darkest memories. And we really like to get across that sports psychology isn't about that. We're trying to help you perform better and enjoy it more at the same time. We like to keep it really simple, really light, so it's accessible because, you know, in the past maybe it, there's been a bit of a taboo around speaking to a psychologist about speaking about this kind of area because it may come across like a weakness right it may seem that if you do admit to having negative thoughts and feeling lots of pressure and perhaps having anxiety then it's a weakness that you don't belong in that squad that the coach is going to perceive you as, as less and it's very important to recognize that's that's not the case and you know if you had a technical issue a coach would fix that right if you had a fitness issue you go in the gym and you work on that 
but too often we have a mental problem and we just assume that we're stuck that it's not changeable and there's no point in doing something about it and that's very very wrong to assume that but what i was saying with how we treat that it's i'm always cautious using this this analogy but in a sense not that it's as clinical we want to make the sessions fun and engaging but i guess the easiest comparison is almost like a doctor's appointment where you get a diagnosis and a prescription so we might say look freddie is having cognitive performance anxiety as a result of perfectionism and pressure from impressing his friends perhaps once we can almost define what the problem is and where the causes and triggers and symptoms are coming from we then better know how we can treat them how we can help them how we can improve them so what it might look like as a as a kind of umbrella term to kind of what what we generally do with performance anxiety is we'd look at what their intentions are what the expectations and the pressure they're placing themselves under are so a lot of the time with performance anxiety we see what we call what i like to call psychological swear words so words like need must have to should right they place this almost metaphorical backpack of pressure on us just by the language we use and sometimes coaches use this language as well without knowing you know you need to perform well we must get a pb their intentions are great but sometimes this this does pile on the pressure once we look at kind of the the preconditions that an individual might be setting themselves it's important to set them up with a framework so they understand and have something to fall back on on how to deal with their thoughts where they might target that what they might actually do in them situations because it's all well and good about talking about the anxiety and figuring out what's going on and the causes and triggers ultimately it's going to show up and often in the worst times so it's very important to understand and have almost a mechanism and a a plan in place of how you're going to deal with them thoughts how you're going to deal with that physiological reaction how you're going to deal with some of them adverse avoidance behaviors that come i think the main thing for all sports is that often they are reactive rather than being proactive So we see abuse in football from 2016, 17 onwards. But then we have to wait a number of years to see the abuse in gymnastics issue come out. And then more recently, abuse in swimming. Next year, it'll be abuse in cricket and some other sports. Sports should be proactive and should be learning from others where they failed or there's been issues. That's the first thing that should change. Secondly is independence and transparency is so key. Because if there's been a breakdown in trust, if someone suffered abuse, to expect them to trust that same institution which failed them initially to then do the right thing and to investigate and to punish their abusers, it isn't going to happen. It doesn't happen without that kind of support and therapy coming from an external body. So I think that those are some of the key things. Be proactive, be independent, be transparent. And always put the athlete first. They must be the paramount concern because without the athletes, there is no sport. I've experienced bullying and it was a difficult time for me. Yes, I think I've definitely seen it. And if I have, you know, a lot of other swimmers and coaches and parents have seen it. Um, I do remember one swimmer when I was younger. um, I remember a few times they would start the race, but then stop in the middle of the pool and then have to get out in the middle of the race. And obviously when you see that, you know, it's quite noticeable. Everyone sees it. So I do remember that. Um, and there was actually quite a few swimmers who would be very, very good in training. And then the racing didn't show what they could do in training. This They are obviously mentally, you know, frightened or scared and couldn't perform in racing what they were doing in training and so I think it is seen a lot um I can't remember what actually was ever done about it um but yeah it's it's just happened a lot first and foremost is is listening to the swimmer isn't it and and that's what I would do at school and and just find out what it feels for them and the right people listening talking to their parents and just guiding the swimmer of like, okay, just 
you know, reflecting on what what it is, what was the triggers, what could we do differently next time, and and everyone needs to, it's the listening and the the swimmer's voice is the most important thing with this. I genuinely think one of the most important skills you can ever have is the ability to manage and deal with your thoughts. Right, we have thousands of thoughts per day. A vast majority of them are negative, and a lot of them are very inaccurate and never come true. But if you don't have a mechanism for managing your thoughts and dealing with them when they arise, then unfortunately you're going to be stuck and dominated and controlled by your thoughts a lot of the time. It's very important to have control over dealing with your thoughts rather than your thoughts controlling you and controlling all your reactions. I've seen that with... Um... Like 13, 14 year olds, I've seen it with um, 17, 18, 19 year olds um, who are so talented. Um, obviously, the coaches want them to stay in, carry on swimming. Parents want them to stay in, carry on swimming. I think to a certain extent, the swimmers probably carry on for longer than they want to. Um, and then just gets to a point where they're burnt out or just completely, you know, completely not themselves, not their own personality anymore. Um, and then, you know, sadly have to stop. But, you know, swimming isn't everything. Um, sport isn't everything. And um, it's people's happiness that is important. But it's sort of what what is it that makes that swimmer get to that point where they're not enjoying it that much? That's what's the sad thing. Everybody has a breaking point. And once that breaking point is reached, you know, they just feel they can't go on, you know. They can't, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And because they've not been taught to identify what's going on with them, to them they say, I'm just done, I can't do this, you know, which is even a safer option than having a total breakdown or using drugs or, or having a mental health breakdown, you know. So these things happen, and they happen more frequently than we know of. We hear of the very prominent ones, prominent athletes. But what about the person that doesn't become an Olympic star but has a lot of potential, you know, and things just go wrong? And wonder, well, how do things go wrong here? What went wrong? He was doing so well. She was doing so well. It didn't start in one day. As a welfare officer, we want to make sure we are approachable um, and everyone, parents, coaches and swimmers, know how to, to come and talk to us at welfare and um, have that place where they can share their worries. Um, and it's just making sure as a club that is signposted so regular communications with parents hi we're here if you need us that type of thing and then getting them to to share their story and share what's happening and then getting together face to face and having a conversation with the parent the swimmer and talking to the coach and making everybody aware of what it is it's it's communication has got to be the key you know i haven't had to deal with anything like this at Soundwell swimming club yet um but it's but that's what I would expect that my inbox would have an email from a parent or a coach saying, "This is what I've noticed. This is different. This is a change in their behaviour. You know, what do you think you can do?" And my first point of call would be to to speak to the swimmer, speak to the parent, and just kind of ask some questions about how's it going and that sort of thing. I think that's one big thing people are afraid of. You know that all. If I say something to my kid, will that bring, make them do something or will that put ideas in their head? No. I think the fear of getting it wrong should never make us do nothing, you know. I mean, we, we live in an information age. All you have to do is go to Google and think, okay, this is what my kid is going through. How do I approach this? You'll find some information or you'll find somebody like me. I mean, I can't tell you how many people come to ask me. I, I don't, people I don't know at all. Somebody would just say, oh, I know somebody who might be able to help you talk to this person. And I don't think I know of one psychiatrist that will refuse to help if they can, you know. I, um, it's a way of giving back, you know. So there will be somebody you can talk to, even if you don't know what to say or what to do, you know. So if you think, don't be afraid to ask a kid, what is going on? Are you... If you are self harming, what is going on? What are you thinking of? Do you feel like harming yourself? Do you have thoughts of wanting to kill yourself? Or are you depressed? Are you afraid? Are you anxious? You should, not be, you should not be afraid to ask those questions. Or do you want to talk to somebody else? Should I take you to somebody else? You know? And even if a kid refuses, 
you can still take them to somebody else to find out, and, you know, even somebody else you can talk to. I think we always need to say something. Now, the flip side is when kids are spoken to badly, you know, I've, I've read enough books and I've seen enough things to know that there's a lot of potential bullying and trauma that can occur with kids doing competitive sports, you know. And these things, if they're not helped, it can be far reaching. You know, trauma leads to its own types of mental illness. You have kids that become emotionally disturbed, unstable, um, they become anxious, they lose their self-esteem, lose their confidence. It's a very high pressure. Competitive sports is very high pressured. And I think that's why it all comes back to the fact that these kids need somebody helping them while they are doing the sports because there's a lot that goes on there, a lot, you know. And a, a parent can do it all. You can't do it all, no matter how engaged and involved you are. So we come back to the point of what you're doing now, um, um, Andrea, to raise awareness that kids need doing this kind of sports. They need mental health support, you know. I think we've come a full 360 now. Well, they need it because it's such a high pressure environment that they do need it. It's, they, there's just no gray area. It's not neither here or there. It has to be done, you know. And if it's not done, I think the consequences are there. And they, they, may, not, they may not be seen this year or next year, but it will come out, you know, if these kids don't get the support they need. And we see it every day. We hear of news. I, 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 I like keeping up with, you know, current affairs. We, hear, we see it every day. Athletes that would have had the world, or they've even had the world, but then they lose it. You think, well, how could it, somebody that has made millions of dollars or millions of pounds just become an alcoholic and lose everything, or becomes a thug and starts using drugs, you know? But what went wrong there? I think it's closely related to mental health issues, you know? They're not being able to cope with the stress of that comes with life. One of the big things that, that I always do on, on my camps is I explain that the triangle, I always use the triangle. So it's the, the swimmer at the top, the parent and the coach, you know, and having that really, really strong communication with those three areas is, is really, really important. Um, <clears throat> sometimes uh, if the coach wants it more than the swimmer, it comes in a bit of an uneven balance. Sometimes when the parent, wants it more than the swimmer ultimately the swimmer is the person that is in there swimming and, and and racing you know they're standing on the blocks they're swimming up and down in training and everything else around the swimmer is a support mechanism and if that isn't there if that swimmer is not enjoying themselves or not communicating with the coach or the parents then it it, it can really really struggle so it's it's yeah, I've seen it many, many, many times. Uh, swimmers have, 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 you know, had all the physical attributes, but then you know they just get to a point when they're just like, this is just too much stress. I, I you know, everyone wants me to swim well, um, and I don't want to do it. So it's it's starting those conversations early and going back to what we were talking about earlier is the the educational side of educating the, uh, and helping the parents. I know now I'm a parent, I've got two, two um, uh, young children. So it's really, really important that the, the parents have the education there. Um, the coaches are supported um, and understand that, you know, their role, what their role is for the, for the young swimmer. I mean, the coach isn't uh, a psychologist, you know, leave the psychology, the experts. You know, we always say, you know, we're not, as a coach, we're guiding them through to swim fast. And if we can bring in expertise from every, you know, other areas, then it makes the athletes much, much stronger. So any one of us will have our own ways in which uh, either physically our body reacts or the way in which we react ourselves to more stressful situations. Um, I think over periods of time within other environments, we learn how to we adapt and how we deal with those. Um, the same should go for sport. Uh, if you know if a child is is suffering issues at an early stage, um, then the open discussion, if somebody to actually recognise that, somebody to say something, somebody to offer some support at an early stage to discuss it, um, can prevent so many issues later on going going on later on. So um, 
I think, yeah, the, the key is, again, communication is actually somebody recognising, somebody speaking to the child, speaking to the parents about that, how that can be supported. And actually, you know, there could be measures put in place to actually try to reassure a child and, and try to address those issues at the earlier stage. I suppose the, the elite athletes, when you get to the very small group of elite athletes, you know, uh, on an you know, international stage, they do have professional support. Um, but of course, some of those behaviours might be, you know, ingrained and, and not ha having been able to be prevented uh, throughout uh, the, the years and years leading up to that particular point. I think when we're not performing, we have a tendency to do more of the same thing that we're already doing. So what I mean by that is we're not performing well, so we think it must be technical. So we put in more work technically, you know we're not performing well or maybe it's a physical thing so we put in more work physically and in the gym as well but i think for me what is neglected is the mind right we your mind is ultimately your control center it's responsible for how you perform and it's very active when we're having these high level competitions but we often don't train it you know, we spend hours with swimming, we spend hours in the pool, we spend hours land training, we spend hours in the gym. We all recognize how important your mindset and psychology is to performance, but we don't do anything about it a lot of the time. A lot of the time, we just assume that we should be able to think clearly, we should be able to manage our thoughts, we should be able to deal with nerves and pressure and anxiety. But if we're never taught how, then how can we expect ourselves to perform under pressure when it really matters? In swimming, it's a very crazy sport because everybody is, you know, half naked all the time, little swimsuits. Um, and it is a huge thing, like as a girl, as a woman, um, starting your periods, going through puberty, Swimming, very difficult with periods when you're first learning, right? Um, half naked, uh, always worried about when periods going to come and how to deal with it. Um, so hard. Never mind just being in school and dealing with it in school um, as a student, but then <laughs> being in the pool. Girls, it's very tricky to learn. Um, and it's not something that I myself you feel com comfortable about talking about with your coach. Um and then obviously like body changes. Um, I think I was quite, I would say I was quite mentally strong with my like body weight and being able to manage what I was eating. I think I was quite lucky with that. But um, it got to a point in my career where we started having our skin folds done. And um, I think I was 15 when I first had my skin fold. At the time, I was just like, whatever it is, what it is, this is what we're doing um and I thought I was quite you know quite slim um you know a fit young girl um but with my first skin fold that I had done um I was actually told that uh, my skin fold was really high compared to the elite athletes which was the aim um so for me I was like oh quite a big shock um so I had to change but well, I got advice to change my diet which um uh, made me more lean which is what they were aiming for in the elite sport. Um, and, you know, I managed with that okay. Not everybody does because um, it can be very difficult. Um, I managed with it fine and my skin folds did come down. I was more lean um, and I improved my swimming over those years. But um, it did get to a point where um, I actually stopped having my periods for quite a few years and I was totally healthy I was totally fine I always had energy I always ate plenty and um, but very you know low fat foods um non and high sugars um but it got to a point where I thought to myself I'd made this up in my head that I thought if I got my period I was too fat mm -hmm. which when I think back to that that is that is a bit nuts um, but I was always healthy and um, there was never any worries about anything like that. But I don't know whether not having any periods is normal in elite sport, but I think mentally that's not right to think that if I have a period, I'm too fat. Um, and obviously girls go through different body changes. So, you know, Andrea, it's, it can be very difficult 
um, the changes the girls go through. Um, and some girls could handle it better than others. Um, but yeah, it's so difficult. And I'd like to think the support is there for girls that really do struggle. Um, but then obviously the boys go through their body changes as well. Um, so there's a lot going on, but that's just from my experience. But I was always healthy, so. Yeah, I, I think it's it's very, very tough. You know, very, very tough. Um, from obviously a, a male point of view, I think um, when I went to race, uh, when I went to race abroad for the first time, and I was standing there and I was looking at the guys I had to race and they were double the size of me. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, I'm not going to be able to beat these guys. They're, they're massive. They're, they're taller than me. They've got longer levers. And I had a massive knock in confidence. Um, and I just really, really struggled with that. And then I dived into the race and I actually did quite well. And I, I sort of asked myself, why am I able to to you know do this and and my coach said look because you've got good technique you've got good pacing and then I started to look at you know all those other processes it's not just about what you look like it's not just about being conscious and looking at other people and that was my um sort of experiences as as a swimmer I think when you're going through it uh, you know when you're coaching swimmers that are going through it is a tough period but the, com the earlier conversations are much, much better. You know, you will, you know, when you get a really fast swimmer from a young age, it's, it's better to have that conversation earlier and say, look, you know, you're swimming super fast. You've made some really, really big jumps in the time. There is going to be a point where, you you know, you're going to, you might get a little PB and the, and the margins get a little bit smaller. And it's sort of education, really, and, and helping the swimmers with that is super super important so any any advice um would be helpful and it's, it's going to come obviously puberty comes when you're growing um always going to be hormone change going on um body shape changing and um, metabolism changing um and it comes at different ages as well obviously which can be a difficult thing um but obviously if you get young athletes performing well at a very young age um is there something that they should be preparing for before BBE comes um, mentally and just sort of in a nutrition side of thing? Um, but I think it should all be positive. You know, it should all be exciting, you know, growing up, learning new things. Um, it should never be a negative thing. It should always be positive. Um, yeah. And I don't think we should shy away from it um, as long as it's always done in a positive way of advising to help um, to get the best out of each individual. Oh, this is huge. All the stakeholders need to be on board with this and with the swimmer's voice at the foremost. And it's understanding the swimmer's perspective is going to be very different from the school teacher, from the parent, from their best friends and the coaches. So it's important that all of us are working together to make sure the student or sorry, the swimmer in this case, um, feels supported from every angle and everybody bring something different to the child's swimming journey? Absolutely. I think that is actually a key thing that needs to happen. Um, with myself, I was quite lucky. I can, well, I was the one, my parents were the ones communicating between my school and what I was doing. And my school was very relaxed and supportive. Um, but not all schools are going to understand and be like that. Um, and if there can be some connection between sports clubs, the swimming clubs and the schools, then amazing. That would be so good. Teachers understand what's going on, like why they're tired in classes, um, sort of timings of everything, competitions, exams. Oh, that would be, I think that would be a key thing, a really good thing to happen. I think collaboration is absolutely, absolutely vital. Um, unfortunately, Historically, the collaboration has been um, uh, in the past mainly around where things have gone wrong. Uh, so, you know, perhaps the school won't be speaking to uh, the club representatives or the parents until something's gone wrong. Uh, and I think actually preventative measures is, is far, far greater. So if, you know, if a child is um, having some issues, 
then quite clearly the the team around the child uh you know that is uh, you know us from, from being parents uh from the school good communication with the school is actually ideal because where the demands quite get, become more difficult be it from either school or from the sport from a particular sport itself um then sometimes those can collide and actually where and and that collision of, of demands on a child can actually put pressure, unnecessary pressure on that child. So any collaboration, any early discussion, any raising of an issue um, to a school um, or, or somebody else around the child can, can be really, really good and, and really positive and actually prevent issues uh, going forward. Um, uh, yeah, like so I, I've seen you know a lot of really, really good practice uh, where excellent people have understood um the the demands on on a particular child or, you know on, on children as they're going through a kind of a, a particular sporting time or a particular difficult time at school um but they're they're encouraged through that and supported through that um uh, and if they're feeling supported throughout the different parts of their lives both from parents and both from uh the, their various environments then that can only be positive so it's absolutely key uh where things are uh, are starting to collide as a swimmer, I train every day and sometimes twice a day. And it can be really disappointing when I've been working really hard and I don't get the time that I want. It affects everyone at different stages. I can just imagine it all happening now um, through my career and through other swimmers around me. Oh, but it gets to a point when you think, when is it enough? There's always chasing times. There's always something you achieve something and then there's the next thing like what you've achieved that's not good enough now we're going on to the next thing <laughs> like even with myself obviously when I was young um I was like oh if I made to Olympics how amazing that be like amazing dream um amazing it happens and then oh, after that's like oh I've got to get a medal and then sort of like being an Olympian wasn't enough and it just gets to a point it's like whoa hang on a minute this is you know putting too much on yourself always putting yourself down always need more always comparing yourself to the best to your friend to your sibling and I guess the point is like this is enough and you just start being good to myself people need to be good to themselves um just know that you're doing the best you can you're happy as uh, yeah I was very hard on myself and I think a lot of athletes are um, but I was very very down that I didn't you know, get the Olympic medal dream, but crazy. I made two Olympics and young athletes just even getting county times and get on the blocks and racing, you know, is inc an incredible achievement and learning how to do that. You're always learning. It just gets to the point where it's like, <laughs> when is it enough? You know, because getting results doesn't bring happiness. Okay. You'd be happy for like, you know, it'd be a day and then it's on to the next thing. So it's sort of knowing that sport doesn't define you as a person, being a good person, being good to people, helping people um, is what makes you a good person and sort of knowing what are your values, what makes you happy and sticking to them. Um, and, you know, just taking results out of it because it's a never ending chasing a goal, chasing happiness when it isn't really the answer. So, yeah, it can get too much um and it's supposed to be for fun a lot of onus comes on the coach of the relationship there and their their ethos and their their training programs and and making sure the swimmers know that it's not a steady incline there are peaks and troughs in training there are peaks and troughs in competing and that's all part of the swimmers journey and it's i think it's the coaches um you know words and encouragement and you know, their, oh, their kind of their feedback is crucial to supporting the swimmer in those times. And, um, you know, those those words that they share are very valuable and need to be said at the right time. And that's where the skilled of the coaches come into it, where the right thing is said at the right time to help them deal with that you know failure or success whichever it is and everybody has their moments and everybody has success it's just looks different in each swimmer 
and one swimmer's success might not be another's but it's still equally important and the coaches recognizing all levels of achievement whether it be counties or just getting to the length of the pool or a tumble turn or something like that is celebrating all successes not just the big ones and also progress you know there's lots and lots of things that coaches can do to make a child feel confident about themselves you know and and just knowing their swimmers is is what a coach i would say is best asset is is know your swimmers yeah so de dealing with failure is 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 daily right because you might get beaten on a training set uh it might be a hard kick set or a it might be a sprint set and you get beaten on every single rep um it's then bouncing back and understanding a, a, a little bit about it and yeah i think it does come back down to education and, and helping the swimmers understand that you know you, you might have i mean i went for a few years without getting a pb you know and that period was just so hard um some of the older swimmers on the team would just sort of sit down and just sort of say to you you know you are going to go through this period of where you're not going to get these these pbs and it's 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 going to be really really tough so um but it, yeah it's 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 really really hard there's there's no there's not one solution there's not like right everyone has to do this i think it's just comes down to education um and communication and making sure that the swimmers don't only focus on the outcome and the time uh, that's the biggest thing that i've learned in in my coaching uh just take away take the emphasis away of getting a a pb just say to them right let's go in you know it can be as simple as go into your next race and really enjoy yourself you know get out there strong work your skills and you know stand behind the blocks and really have a smile on your face that that a simple conversation might really trigger that that individual um, so it's just really working on those processes and helping that with that education. I mean, it's not just in swimming, right? It's in it's in all other sports um, that are time based. You know, it's not. It is a little bit different in individual sports because you are reliant solely on yourself. You're standing on the block on your own. No one can go in and swim your race. Uh, when you're in a team, you have that team support network around you. Um, and if you fail, I guess you fail as a team. So then you can look left and right at your teammates and go, oh, guys, what happened today? Oh, gosh, yeah, I, you know, I think we could do better. But as an individual, it's a, it's a, it's a lot more pressure uh, coming down on you as an individual. So it's, it's, it's just working on those, those processes and, and helping the swimmers with the, the education and the understanding. And I, I'm a big believer in that positive reinforcement i've had swimmers that haven't pb'd for two years three years but then when they get over that hurdle and they start swimming fast again it's so rewarding and you know and, and they and they sort of stuck at it is is it's great um i think it's just asking you know are you happy um and did you do your best because if you try your best then that's all you can do you can't do better than your best effort um just always being positive supportive try not to have it on the result never comparing to anyone the comparing is you know the the nasty part of it comparing is always going to be there and it's a natural instinct i think we have as humans but comparing is always are you going to put yourself down um if you're just in a race doing everything for yourself um, focusing on yourself, doing your best, not looking at anyone else, um, then I think uh, that's the way to be. It's just focus on what you can do. Parents as well, just saying, you did your best. You can't compare yourself to anyone else because you are not anybody else. You're you. And um, did you have fun? And just always say, make sure you have fun today because that's what it's about. Uh, everyone wants their kids to be happy. Um, that's what parents want. So... Yeah, it's about being happy.
Yeah, I think I think open communication is is one of the absolute keys to it. Um, knowing what uh, what your child is doing for a parent, and knowing what the, so the child knows what they're doing is absolutely key. Um, I think you know open discussion about uh, issues is is absolutely key to this as well. Um, young people are very resilient, but uh, but they they need guiding in the right way, uh, and if actually. For example, you know, I have seen um, those that express concerns even suspended. Um, but the, the, I think the key to it is actually making sure that the clubs listen um, and actually involve children. You know, many good clubs have actually got um, actually one or two children actually bring forward ideas from the youngsters themselves, from various squads, etc. They might have squad representatives. Um, so it, it's a communication between the children. You know, the the, the the youngsters just don't attend a club and you know, swim and come away. They're actually interacting with their peers all the time. They're interacting with the coaches. And that communication can be really, really good. Um, you know, if there's a particular issue, as, you know, we've seen within, you know, within various clubs, of course, um, then a, a really positive way in which to, to deal with that is actually, actually get the club uh, together, get a squad together if it's squad related, uh, get a group of children together and actually positively discuss it say you know these are the expectations of behavior this is how we expect you to treat each other um and actually be positive they want to enjoy it and actually it's giving the, them the ability to talk about how that they can best enjoy the, the sport uh, and actually attend uh, etc so it, it's kind of part education of them part encouragement to talk um and and getting them involved and listening to them so that that is really key to me I think helping helping parents. I mean, we get a lot of swimmers uh, parents come to us, and they just uh, you know we're we're sort of um, uh, we're sort of a, a non biased body, if you like, of what we do, and and the parents can have that conversation openly with us about. You know, we, we get all the time asked about training volumes. You know, how much should a, my daughter be swimming? How many meters in a week? And, you know, it's, 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 you know, is it right to do this? Is it right to do that? Is it wrong to do this? Is it wrong to do that? It's just being able to have that conversation and, and, and helping the parents understand that, you know, some coaching philosophies are like this, some coaching philosophies are like this. There's no, right or wrong is understanding and helping educating the the parents is really really important um i'm also passionate about supporting the coaches the coaches have a have a pretty tough job um especially in 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 swimming clubs uh the they the more support that we give the coaches the more tools we give the coaches um then the more they're likely to carry on coaching um and and enjoy their coaching uh one of the hardest thing i think in in club coaching is is you know being able to uh you know get support and that's that's really really key and i think that's something that we've just got to keep moving forward it's got a lot lot better but i think it's really important that we we help support the coaches it's important to recognize that you can change your psychology, you can change your reactions and you can change your response to a lot of the thoughts you have. I think something that, that comes up a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, I think when we speak with, with swimmers, with sports people in general, they often come and speak to us as almost a last resort. This has been happening for such a long time and this is the almost the final throw of the dice and a, a common pattern that emerges is that individuals feel like they're stuck. They're stuck with this brain that's always going to be negative and create these negative responses and always hold them back. But a very important thing to recognise is that you can change your responses. You're not stuck it's just patterns right you've just the reason you think you've stuck is because a pattern has been repeating itself for so long that it feels like it's going to be forever but you can ultimately change your responses and sports psychology speaking to a psychologist in general whether that's about your performance or whether that's about your mental health is framed very very wrongly shall we say that you know speaking to a psychologist isn't a weakness 
actually speaking to a sport and performance psychologist is a huge strength as it shows that you're willing to put in the work, willing to make the changes that are very difficult, but are ultimately going to be very rewarding. I suppose fairly easy to deal with externally exhibited behaviour. Um, part of the advice given is actually to be able to speak to a child, you know, during, you know, if you've got, you know, somebody even committing, you know, even criminal behavior within clubs uh well the key is actually try to understand and educate uh and, and that for me is absolutely key because um you're not going to help that child actually prevent that those issues just by dealing with it in a certain way so there's there will be different ways in which you can you can deal with that but the key to it is actually understanding and speaking to that child and giving that child the opportunity to say well actually this is going on or that's going on um and this is the reason i did it um and it, you know if you can support and educate that child while still making uh, the environment safe for everyone else uh, because that's a that's a you know another key uh, key factor to it so it is a balance but certainly listening to the child and actually supporting the child to understand uh, the consequences of the actions uh, and they might be a, a very short kind of consequence but actually longer term potentially that could that could assist certainly um I've had ways in which I've dealt with certain criminal um, criminal acts uh, committed by children, but it's the, there's still a recognition, actually, they are children. And once a certain processes are dealt with, then it's really good to try to educate them uh, in a way in which they can they can be supported and actually you know, make everyone safer around the whole the whole club, etc. So um Elite, come elite athletes at that level need to have it. They need to have somebody. The club needs to provide somebody who would talk regularly to these kids to find out what is going on. I think that's really important because these are kids that are spend all their time in school or they're in games. They don't spend too much time just being at home. So there has to be somebody who is trained to notice these things. You know, I, I don't think it's a gray area, you know. And even if it's okay, we don't have too much money. There are some people like me that will be happy to volunteer. I can bet that there are lots of people that work in mental health who want to give back and will be able to provide services to volunteer, you know. So I don't think that should be a problem. You know, sport, sport, sport varies. Um, you know, I've actually been you know, significantly encouraged also by working with some of the smaller sports. Some of them have got, you know, a, a true... Um, guidance set of guidance for so that you know what is expected like you know a child should be welcome to the club they should be encouraged uh to partake in the club whilst there everyone should be um encouraged to protect a child um that they're you know appropriately treated uh whilst they're at the club um and also respected as as uh, as, as children uh because they've got the you know everyone as a child and every every child has got their own their own views their own feelings, their own experiences, um, and to respect those uh, and listen to those is, is absolutely key. So, um, you know, to reinforce the good work that, uh, that many, many are doing around, uh, around clubs, um, I, would, I would support that. Sports psychology is hugely important and it's a massively growing industry and there's good reason for that because people are recognising now that ultimately psychology is the difference between, you know, a, a podium and and been last in the race right it's it's so so important to be able to manage and deal with the pressure that you get put under and it's just that sports psychology is a critical aspect of high performance without good mental health it would be difficult to have good physical health it's as important just like the way that um if you have a child who's an athlete, you, you pay attention to the diet, you encourage them to exercise. That is the same way we should be encouraging them to have good mental hygiene. You know, just as they have good physical hygiene, they have to have good mental hygiene, which is knowing how to take care, keep your mental health clean. You know, it is really, really vital. Um, just like we, because I've brushed my teeth today, doesn't mean that I will, I will brush it tomorrow. The same way mental health has to be taken care of every single day. I mean, if I, with 20, over 20 years experience working in mental health, need to take care of my mental health, I need to apply, I need to relearn things. Everybody needs to. Every kid needs to. And kids that are in the high pressure world of competitive sports, competitive swimming, they need to. It is, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of providing 
good mental health care support for these kids? I think um, clubs are really, really good at being resourceful. Uh, and actually, if they see an issue, then it's to be dealt with. For me, um, and if they were to receive guidance, uh, guidance from national governing bodies can take time. Um, uh, and of course, it's, it won't, the guidance necessarily won't be specifically, uh, won't specifically apply to that particular set of circumstances. Every, you know, every case we get in, every, every issue has its own nuances. It, they're all slightly different. And I think if a club reacts to that with guidance, but uh, with guidance perhaps from the safeguarding team, but if the club reacts to it, that is far, far better than waiting for perhaps months and months and months for you know, there to be uh, uh, guidance or legislation passed down by, uh, by national governing bodies. Um, the, the circumstances around a child that needs reacting to, um, and uh, and you know it's not something that should be weighted. Uh, it should be awaiting um, uh, guidance by the national governing bodies. So, uh, as long as the right advice is given, um, then uh, you know the clubs could have confidence to to act. Bill Shankly, the former Liverpool football uh, manager, famously said that football was actually more important than life and death. Um, it's something I totally disagree with, and I think for far too long in sport, we focused on medals and success rather than the welfare and the well-being of our athletes. That is wrong. It always has been wrong. Sport is there to enjoy, and it's supposed to be pleasurable, it's supposed to be a good thing, good for society, good for the individuals involved. The success, the medals, must always be secondary to that. We need to protect our athletes. Because without them, there is no sport. And ultimately, what we're trying to do with, with all mental health for, for the children is, <clears throat> for the swimmers, is just help them understand and, and start the conversations and help them with their, you know, not just being so outcome driven and focus on the processes. So, but I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. I think we've, you know, like I said, I don't want to repeat myself, but I, I think we're, we're starting to understand a little bit more about what we need to do um, from this conversation today. If it, if it helps one person, it helps one person. If it helps more, then, you know, it's, 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 it's really, really positive, I think. Thank you, Andrea. I hope that, you know, my experiences and advice helps any young swimmers and parents out there. Wow. When we got started on this project, I had no idea where it was going to take us. And I have to say, I have been absolutely blown away by the content, the advice and guidance that all of our experts have shared. So really sincere thanks from me to them for giving up their time and really stepping in, stepping up to support this project. I really appreciate it. So I didn't just want to leave it there with a big discussion about what the problems are. We want to be really forward thinking and uh, give you some ideas about how you can get started. So one of the things that we think is key is to find out what your members think and how they feel. And the way to do that is a survey. So we have worked with our experts to come up with a list of survey questions. Um, they've changed how we position those questions to make sure we're asking the right questions in the right way and those questions are available in our template um, guide which is part of the pdf that accompanies this video the other thing that we want to do is to really encourage people to skill up you don't know what you don't know right so we have partnered with a terrific organization called freecoursesinengland.co.uk and working with them we've come up with this list of courses that we think would be terrific now listen all of these are completely free they're available Available online, you get a level two qualification with them, which is the equivalent of a GCSE, grade A star to C, and you can take it with you anywhere you go. It's not just for clubs, parents, teachers, anybody interested in just increasing their knowledge can take it. So here are the courses that we're recommending. Mental health first aid, children and young people's mental health, men's mental health, counseling skills, self-harm and suicide prevention, awareness of mental health problems, distressed behavior and challenges in children and understanding autism. 
So we hope that you all look into those courses and think they're a good idea too. We have some more resources in the guide, some cool stuff like a template letter that clubs can use and send to schools or well, send to a swimmer that gives to a school that really encourages the school to collaborate with us and gives the schools some ideas of things that they can do to support swimmers as well. So I haven't got time to go through everything that's in the guide, but please do check out the PDF guide. We've made all of this content completely free. So if you have found it valuable, please like it and share it and pass it on to other clubs. Let's not keep any of this a secret. And we can't wait to start hearing about the positive things that you're doing and to share those best practices so we can all work together to help improve the lives of our young athletes. Thank you so much.